The Lord be with you. I invite you to turn with me in your copy of Holy Scripture or follow along here behind me in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We'll be reading verses 19 through 26 there. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, beginning with verse 19. If for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For all, as all died in Adam, so all will be made alive in Christ, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end, when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. May God bless the reading and hearing of Holy Scripture. Would you pray with me? And now, O God, give us ears to hear. Ears to hear your words. Lord, that we may do what you call us to do. That we may be the people you call us to be. So Holy Spirit, speak to us now. Help us to hear. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, it was the summer between my junior and senior year of college. It was the first time I'd ever been on an airplane. We went from Atlanta to Newark. And the only thing remarkable about that flight was on the side of that AirTran Airbus was Elton John. I remember that. We flew from Atlanta to Newark and then the the big hop across the pond to a little town called Paris. I don't know if you've heard of it. We got there. We weren't there long. We were just there long enough to put our our suitcases in in a rented room for the day. I remember sitting on the counter in the room was an ashtray, a cigarette still lit in it. I think they give you one of those when you get to Paris. We walked around on the streets. We didn't have much time. We had to skip the Louvre, didn't get to see the art there. Uh, I remember we were walking on the street and trying to find the Eiffel Tower. We heard it was a sight to see. We asked somebody, hey, where is the Eiffel Tower? Somebody goes, it's right there. Sure enough, right behind the building, there it was. So we went to see it. It got on up about lunchtime, and we were hungry, as I often am. And there was a little cart there. We went over. And I think we bought a, a, Sally was with me, it was me and five other uh, of our friends from Sanford. Walked over to the cart and got what I thought was a ham and cheese sandwich and I'm sure a Coke if Sally was with me. And we sat down on the curb and we split this ham and cheese sandwich right in front of that great facade of the Cathedral of Notre Dame. We got to go inside it. The only thing I had ever seen that was even close to it was the chapel at Beeson Divinity School at Sanford, which is just pitiful compared to Notre Dame. The great rose windows, as you walked in those those heavy oak doors, there were the relief uh, uh, there carved in the stone of the twelve apostles, almost ushering you in the door. And all the little alcoves and chapels, great pieces of art that they just had out there, like they were pictures of their grandmama hanging on the wall. Pictures of sculptures and paintings and stained glass I had only seen as a kid in school in textbooks. And there they were. And people just going on about their business like the history wasn't hanging on the wall right there. In my mind at that time, I thought, man, this has been here for centuries. This great, st- it felt more, not like a church. You know what it felt like? It felt like a castle. Like it would never come down. But you all know what happened. Sitting at my computer this week, all of a sudden notifications. Notre Dame is on fire. On fire? Well, surely they'll put it out. Somebody was smoking. That's what happened. Surely they'll put it out. Then the spire falls. And now there are pictures. Ash, rubble, burnt wood. 
this great edifice of certainty charred and burned. Isn't it something? Things we almost take for granted. Certainty itself is so often unwound and turned upside down, most often when we least expect it. We have all kinds of certainties in our life, but it's not new to us. The ancients were certain about a lot of things. They were pretty certain that the earth was flat and that the sun went around the earth. And if you didn't like that, they, they either excommunicated you or worse. They were pretty certain about it. People in, in the days of Christ even were certain that, that if you had a baby girl, do you know what happened? Well, it was like a casserole you pulled out of the oven about five minutes too early. It was still okay. It was still fine. You could still enjoy it, but it wasn't a boy. It wasn't finished all the way like it was supposed to. They were certain about that. They were certain that a woman's hair was a part of her reproductive system. That's why prostitutes shaved their head. They figured, hey, no hair, no baby. But you know better. But they were certain. They were certain. They were also certain that when someone dies, they stay dead. That the body stays in the ground to rot and the soul is liberated. The, the ancient philosopher Socrates started this whole dualism of the body and soul. The body dies, is corrupted, and decays, but the soul lives on forever. They were certain about that. And then along comes this this prophet, this rabble-rouser in Nazareth who dies but doesn't stay dead. And then his followers start telling everybody that he didn't stay dead and people don't know what to do about that. Death? That's certain. It's the end. It's over. But resurrection? I'm sorry, it doesn't make any sense. And so you can imagine, even the first Christians don't really know what to do with all this. Certainly not the Christians at Corinth, who would have grown up listening to the teachings of Socrates and those who followed them. And so here's Paul. Paul writing to these early Christians to tell them, no, all the certainty you have is uprooted and turned upside down because of one reality. The resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. For his resurrection disrupts our certainties. All of our certainties. With the reality of a love that will not stay dead. And so what Paul says is Christ's resurrection, it disrupts all of our certainties. Even certainties we have about life itself. And we have some strange ones. One I was reminded of recently, my friend Andrew from college, it was just a little passing thing, just something silly, but he was telling the world that he was retiring his backpack. I know, earth-shaking stuff, right? He'd had this backpack since we were in college, and he put a little picture of it up. He said, all oh, the zippers are worn out, it's threadbare. But what caught my attention, he said, but the little cell phone pocket is just fine. In this backpack, there was a cell phone pocket that was about this big. Think about that for a minute. He bought that backpack back when phones were about that big. When the smaller your phone, the better, right? And here it was. I mean, it said on there, cell phone pocket. Don't put pins in it. Don't put a water bottle in it. That pocket is for a cell phone, and it's going to be for a cell phone until Jesus comes back. Now, you can't put the smallest phone now in that pocket. We have certainties about things. We don't even think. BMW came out with a luxury sedan in the 90s that came with its own cell phone. If you bought that car on a used lot now, you would be laughed at. We have certainties about life, that this is the way things go, that they'll always be this way. But what happens? Anytime we have a certainty, anytime we are sure about something, inevitably what? It's disrupted. And that's what happens here. These ancients with their Socratic way of viewing the world, body bad, soul good. 
When I die, my soul will be liberated from this garbage can of a body and I'll get to live maybe in an eternal plane, maybe in enlightenment, I don't know. But this body sure won't let me down anymore. And, and I can see the appeal of that. I mean, you looking at me, you know what I'm talking about. I get up in the morning and go, man, my back didn't used to hurt like this. Man, I, probably, I, I like to eat cake, but my goodness, I couldn't understand the appeal. When I die, I don't have to worry about this anymore. I don't have to worry about cutting my hair. I don't have to worry about them weird mustache hair that curl inside your mouth. I don't have to worry about any of that stuff anymore. I'm free from it. I can understand the appeal. But Paul says, no, no, no. That's not how it works. Christ's resurrection has upturned all of that. He says, if for this life only we have hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. What Paul says there is if you're believing that this life when it's over, your body just gets to stay there and you get to float away like some looney tune sitting on a cloud with a harp and wings and a halo. He said, that's not it. You've misinterpreted it. You messed it up. If you hope for only this life, we are of all people most to be pitied, he says. Why? Because Christ has been raised from the dead, back from the grave, not disappeared like some magic trick. He's back, raised the first fruits, he says, of those who have died. For since death came through a human being, resurrection of the dead has also come through a human being. For as all die in Adam, so most will be made alive in Christ. So the elect will be made alive in Christ. So, a f- so the Baptist, will, oh, heaven help us, will be made alive in No. So all will be made alive in Christ. Paul's use of the parallel of Adam to Christ there is not just for, for a neat little package. It's there to talk about the universal reality of resurrection. Just as sin came into all through one person, Paul says, so resurrection comes to all through one person. This life, this life, this side of life is not all there is, Paul says. It continues on even after death. And death's certainty gets disrupted by Christ's resurrection as the first of all the resurrections to come. I think sometimes, because we put it, Paul puts this at the end of his letter, we tend to do that. Uh, Us clergy type, I'm going to let you all in on a little secret. Most of us, after church this morning, will either take our collars off, loosen our our ties, kick off our heels, our boots, whatever, and we're going to go, oh, I'm glad, I mean, it was good, but I'm glad that's over. We tend to think of Easter as the end of something. We even call Sunday, which is uh, all Sundays are the little Easter's, we call it part of the week end. But I'll let you in on something. Christ's resurrection is not the end. It's the beginning. Christ's resurrection from the dead signals the beginning of God's great disruption, bringing about God's reign, the kingdom of God. And as long as I can remember, I, I, I've, I've always thought we sort of get that a little backwards. We, we kind of hope that and pray for people to, to get saved, to walk the aisle, to get baptized. And then we kind of act like that's the thing. Right? I remember when I was baptized, someone, thank, thank God, someone pulled me aside and said, I want you to understand something, Chris. This isn't the end. This is just the beginning. And the same is true of Easter Sunday. The same is true of Christ's resurrection. It's not the end. It's not the end of the story. You don't close the back of the book and go, well, that was nice. I'll pick it back up at Christmas, come back around again at Easter. No, it's the beginning. That's why Paul puts it in order. Did you notice that? But each in his own order, Paul says, Christ, not the final fruits, the first fruits. Then it is coming those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. When he hands over the kingdom to God, the Father, after he has destroyed every ruler and every authority and every power. It's not the, not the end. It's the beginning. 
Christ's resurrection isn't just about a divine victory over death. It's the beginning of the great undoing, the great redoing, the great disruption of God of this world. The beginning of setting things right side up. It's the beginning of disrupting our certainties about how things work in the world and the order of power and authority. Because when it all comes down to it, Jesus' resurrection disrupts all of our certainties. But most of all, it disrupts the very certainty of death itself. Because there's something really final about death. I remember when that was made real to me. It was not too long after I came here. I was driving into the office one day. We had a funeral in a couple of days. And as I drove by the cemetery, about a half a dozen men with shovels and mattocks digging a hole. I thought, what in the world do they do? Don't they know? They got machines for that now? And so I drove up and said, what are y'all doing? They said, we're, we're, we're digging. The... My friends think that's the wildest thing. It's like, they're digging the grave. You mean by hand? I was like, no, you shovels, but yeah. <laughs> and so I, I went home, put on some old dirty pants and a t-shirt, and said, hey, I'm, I'm a big old boy. I can take a few swings with a mattock. I can lift some dirt. And I remember it was odd. I think I was standing in one with Jake. Standing there, and all of a sudden, it just hit me. We are standing in somebody's grave. We are standing in a place where tomorrow we're going to lower somebody who, who we've had conversations with. We're going to put in this hole somebody that we love, somebody we've talked to, somebody we've stole, told stories about and told stories on. We're about to put them in this hole tomorrow. And maybe we'll put them in a concrete box and lower a lid on it. Maybe we'll put them in a fiberglass dome, but we're going to put dirt over it. We're going to wait. The rain's going to fall and the grass is going to grow. There's something final about that. Death. Certain. Or is it? Today says it's not. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And the last enemy to be destroyed, Paul says, is death. Of all the things we can be certain of in this world, death seems to be the ultimate certainty. We can argue about everything from baseball, religion, and politics, but at the end of the day, it seems the most certain thing ever is death. We'll all die, we say. Even, even astrophysicists are now saying, eventually the cosmos will die. It'll stretch out so far that eventually nothing will attract anything. There'll be no heat. It'll just be the big freeze. Everything will die. Death seems inevitable, seems to be the ultimate certainty. Our biology will give way to age, to illness, to accidents, to the ever-ticking clock of time. And yet even this most inevitable of all certainties is disrupted by God. It's disrupted by the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And if that certainty, the certainty of death, is disrupted, I cannot help but wonder to myself, what other certainties is God disrupting even now? What other certainties do we cling to that God in the power of Christ's resurrection is always disrupting? What things do we think we've got it all figured out and God is disrupting it? What things are we so certain are making our lives miserable and intolerable and God is there waiting to disrupt it? What are all the certainties? I'm not good enough. Never have been, never will be. What's that God disrupting that certainty in our lives? What is it? You've got them. Name them. God's waiting to disrupt those certainties even now. Because Jesus' resurrection is about so much more than just a ticket to a heavenly home. It's a disruption of all that we claim to be certain. 
It's a disruption of all the certainties we cling to. Certainties of life, of sin, of death, of reality. God is disrupting all of those realities in the resurrection of Christ. Because Christ's resurrection is God's ultimate disruption. And so I ask you, what is it right now, on this Easter morning, when God disrupts even the certainty of death, that God needs to disrupt in you today. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on us. Have mercy on us, Lord, when we cling to our certainties tighter than we cling to you. For we know even now, God, that you disrupt them as you've disrupted the most seemingly certain thing of all, death itself. Help us, Lord, to take hold of that hope that you are there with us, calling us, disrupting even those things that keep us from ourselves, from one another, and from you. Help us to take hold of that hope. Take hold of the love you have for us, that you've shown for us by the disruptive power of your resurrection. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.